And I'm going to just take a few minutes and share something I just feel has been stirring on me um, in prayer for you all. And I was actually going to speak on a different passage for this topic, but I, I feel like I might just go with John 4. And um, so if you have your Bible, you can turn to John 4. And I want to share kind of into this word that we even were releasing in, in worship just about the love of God and the source that Jesus Christ is. And I have a sense, a couple different just unctions. First, I feel like there might be somebody in this room tonight and you have um, some fiercely praying parents. And they um, are praying for you and you maybe are in a season of wondering, a season of faith crisis. And the Lord has directed your steps here uh, for whatever reason you landed here. And I feel tonight is just a confirmation that you were actually made for this. It's not just because your parents are Christians that you're here tonight. When you were made for the presence of God. It's who you really are. You're not faking when you follow Jesus. Any other identity is a fake. <laughs> you were made for the glory of God and the purposes of God. And it's bigger than just your parents. You have a call on your life and you are wanted in the kingdom of God. And, and the Lord is not playing games about that. He's in pursuit of you tonight. And today's a day of decision where you can go all in, like even Joe was talking about, in this relationship with the Lord, he's pursuing you. And tonight, I just believe, is a night where you respond to him and say, I'm all in. So, Lord, we just pray for that person, whoever they are tonight. And even if they're outside of this building, we declare today's a day of salvation over our city. We declare, Lord, that your people are hearing your voice, that they don't harden their hearts in rebellion, but that they are responsive to the spirit of God that is leading them to life in Jesus' name. So John 4. So, um, so this is a familiar passage. If you um, are a Jesus follower and have read the Bible or been in church any length of time, you'll know this is the story of a woman at a well. And one of my favorite passages because it's both this beautiful combination of not just this woman um, who is in like a relational, her whole world as far as relationships go um, is really not what any human wakes up and says, oh, I want that relational life. <laughs> She's having a lot of relational problems and Jesus um, comes to her as the son of God, but also as a human. He's God incarnate. He is fully God, fully human. And I love this passage because we get a glimpse of the humanity of Jesus. He's, he literally is sitting down tired, hungry, and thirsty. But yet he's fully God. He's reading this woman's mail, and he's calling her to eternal life at the same time. And I want um, just to highlight a couple of things, but let's start. You know what? I'm just going to read this, and as I read it, Holy Spirit is going to speak to you. Jesus knew the Pharisees had heard that he was baptizing and making more disciples than John. Though Jesus himself didn't baptize them, his disciples did. So this is John 4, verse 3. So he left Judea and returned to Galilee. He had to go through Samaria on the way. Eventually, he came to the Samaritan village of Sychar, near the field that Jacob gave to his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there, and Jesus, tired from the long walk, sat wearily beside the well about noontime. Soon a Samaritan woman came to draw water, and Jesus said to her, Please give me a drink. He was alone at the time because his disciples had gone into the village to buy some food. The woman was surprised, for Jews refused to have anything to do with Samaritans. She said to Jesus, you are a Jew, and I am a Samaritan woman. Why, why are you asking me for a drink? Jesus replied, if you only knew the gift God has for you and who you are speaking to, you would ask me, and I would give you living water. But sir, you don't have a rope or a bucket, <laughs> she said, and this well is very deep. Where would you get this living water? Again, I mean, do you just, don't you just love reading this story? I mean, Jesus and this woman, they are missing each other at this point in the conversation. And besides, verse 12, do you think you're greater 
She's asking Jesus, the son of God, and do you think you're greater than our ancestor Jacob who gave us this well? How can you offer better water than he and his sons and his animals enjoyed? And Jesus replied, anyone who drinks this water will soon become thirsty again. But those who drink the water I give will never be thirsty again. It becomes a fresh bubbling spring within them, giving them eternal life. Please, sir, the woman said, give me this water. Then I will never be thirsty again, and I won't have to come here to get water. Go and get your husband, Jesus told her. I don't have a husband, the woman replied. Jesus said, You're right, you don't have a husband, for you have had five husbands and you aren't even married to the man you're living with now. You certainly spoke the truth. Sir, the woman said, you must be a prophet. Tell me, why why is it you Jews insist that Jerusalem is the only place of worship while we Samaritans claim it is here on Mount Gerizim where our ancestors worshiped? Jesus replied, Believe me, dear woman, the time is coming when it will no longer matter whether you worship the Father on this mountain or in Jerusalem. You Samaritans know very little about the one you worship, while we Jews know all about him, for salvation comes through the Jews. But the time is coming, indeed it's here now, when true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. The Father is looking for those who will worship him that way, for God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship in spirit and in truth. Okay. Wow, that was a long passage and I hadn't prepared for this text. So sorry about the pronunciation of those words. Anyway, there are a few things I want to highlight just about this that is in the theme of what we've been praying for. And that is how worship hits our everyday life. Okay. So Jesus comes to this woman and first he is talking to her about living water. And I love this because he's contrasting something here. She, she's thirsty. They're at a well. They have, a, they have like a real need, a God design need for water. You can only go so long without water and you die. There's this, this God given need for natural water and she's there thirsty. Jesus is there thirsty. But it's also this amazing parallel to me of even this woman's natural relational life. She's had five husbands. She has been living with a man who's not her husband. And she has, like all of us, this human need to be loved, to love and to be loved. It's God designed wiring in us to love and be loved. Just like we have this need for water and food. We're hardwired for this to love and be loved, to be able to drink water when we're thirsty. God, you made us this way. But Jesus is contrasting even this, that he's saying anything that is a temporal need, anything that you have here on earth that you're hardwired for, it still leaves you thirsty. Your soul will still be parched. You cannot fill your spiritual need with this earthly source. You've got to have this eternal source for this spiritual need. So he's speaking now to her and she's getting uncomfortable, okay? He even says things like the man you're living with now is not your husband. This is really insightful because in the cultural air that we swim in, sometimes we say to ourselves, well, if I'm living with him, then, you know, I'm just married before God. God sees it. Like, you know, you, you're not married unless you're married before God and man. Man, marriage is separate than living with somebody, Jesus says, the man you're living with is not your husband. He doesn't say you evolved to be husband just because you lived together long enough. You get me? So why would he be so evasive? I mean, this is not gentle Jesus. This is like, whoa. Because he's trying to drive her to the eternal source. But first, she's got to recognize and own up that she's thirsty and her wells are broken cisterns. Jeremiah says that Israel keeps drinking from these wells that are broken. They can't satisfy. That Jesus is the source. So he comes and he reveals herself, himself to her as this source that doesn't run dry. 
And then he begins to talk about how those who worship God worship in spirit and in truth and that the Father is looking for worshipers. This is amazing because think about this context. To me, it's like worship. He talks to her about worship. She's getting hung up on the where of worship. You're going to worship here. You're going to worship there. We were divided about this, Jews and Samaritans. But he says worship is not about the where. Worship is about who do you worship and how do you worship. Are you worshiping in spirit are you worshiping like, is it, is it not just this external thing, but is your whole being engaged with this adoration to God? This spirit worship, he says, I'm looking for people because he was done. He said in Isaiah, I am done with the people who worship me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. He's not into it. He was so fed up in Isaiah. He was like, forget the gatherings. I don't even want your gatherings. Because you've got the outward bit of worship, but your heart, you're not worshiping in spirit. You're not actually gazing and engaging with me. So he's looking for those who worship in spirit and in truth. So it's not the where, it's not in Samaria or in Jerusalem. It's not Jesus says the time is coming when that's not going to be. It's the how are you worshiping? Are you worshiping in spirit? Are you born again? Is your spirit now communing with God and you're fellowshipping with me? And are you worshiping in truth? Are you worshiping Jesus Christ, the, the son of God being revealed to you by the Holy Spirit? And right in the midst of this racial, you know, this is a, a story as well of racial tension between two different people groups and not just the racial tension, but then you've got the cultural barriers of women and men and rabbis and women. And it's like all these things. He comes in, he meets her, he offers her, reminding her of the eternal source. And then he says to her at the beginning of the conversation, if you knew who is speaking to you, you would ask me for living water. Here stood a man, the son of God, standing in front of a woman who had five husbands and the man she's living with is not her husband. Standing in front of her is the son of God. And this son of God looks and knows every relational breakup and heartache and rejection that she's ever had. And he says to her, if you knew who I was, you'd be asking me. Because what you're really thirsty for is in front of your face. It can't be filled with a husband, and it can't be filled by a man. There's a source in front of you that if you drink it, it becomes an artesian well within you and never runs dry. This source, it transcends any earthly relationship. It's the source we were made for, to drink from this well of knowing God, knowing him, worshiping in truth, and fellowshipping with him in the spirit. So why do we sometimes, you know, in these moments, like let's just break it down. In these moments where we have corporate worship, you know, worship is such a broad topic, but I'm going to bring it down just specifically. If you take all the different expressions of worship, of our adoration and our devotion to Jesus, to God, and let's just look specifically at this this aspect of corporate worship. One of the reasons why we love to create these atmospheres where we're corporately singing, where we're corporately pausing in God's presence is because we're trying to learn how to drink from the well of living water. How to activate that spirit place so we can tap into that eternal source. We've got to learn how to drink. In fact, when we first started a couple years ago, I can't remember, um, I think it was before lockdown, <laughs> we hit this thing in prayer where it's like every prayer meeting that, we, that I went to, people were having this vision and they're coming to me and they say, Pastor Stacey, I see this. I see it's like we've got these people and we're all around this well and people are dying of thirst, but they don't know how to drink. They're there at the well, but they don't know how to take the water in. And so we all have to learn how to walk and move and function in this new life of God. All of us. It's just like a baby learns to walk and talk. When you're born again, you still grow into maturity and you grow in your capacity to hear God, to know God, to worship God. 
and these corporate settings, we are here learning and growing together what it means to worship God. And this corporate gazing and personal gazing of God is relevant for every circumstance and season of life. Because it's a way that we drink from the artesian well within us. How do we take what Jesus said about this fresh bubbling spring within us? How do we tap into that when we feel lonely and dry and rejected? How do we access that when we feel burned out and tired and exhausted? When we're contending for the promise, how does it get, how does faith get functional? It's learning these things, these simple things of learning about when we come together and we're singing. We're not just singing, we're drinking. When we're praying and we're prophesying, we're not just doing some stuff because we need something to do. We're drinking from an artesian well that's flowing in us. It's satisfying our thirsty soul in scorched places. It's opening up rivers on high plateaus. Come on, how do we access that kind of life where Jesus said through the prophet Isaiah in Isaiah 58 that you live in sun-scorched places, but you'll be like a well-watered garden. How do we tap into that? We do very simple things. We sing. We dance. We pray. We fast. We prophesy. We read the word. And when we do those things, we turn on the tap and the water starts running. We're hardwired with the pipes and we've got the water in us. But sometimes you can be thirsty and dying of thirst because you're not yet turning on the tap. So I guess in in thinking of this, this woman and everything that she was going through, Jesus is offering her this living water, the Holy Spirit within her. And then he's talking about worship and the father seeking worshipers. So to bring this even to another story that I was going to preach on, Acts 16, these circumstances where Paul and Silas are in prison. They're in prison, but forward, back up to the beginning of Acts 16, and Paul actually gets a vision where people are saying, come, come to Macedonia. So he, he's tried to go to two other places and the spirit of Jesus has closed the door and he's not been able to go. So this is at the beginning of Acts 16. Then he gets a vision saying, come to Macedonia. He goes to Macedonia and then Lydia gets saved. He casts a demon out of this demon-possessed girl. There's a riot in the crowd and then he's thrown into prison in the place where he was assigned to go. He's not given a trial. It's complete injustice. They're not even working the system rightly. They throw him into prison, into the deepest part of the prison, and they shackle him. So now he, Paul and, si- so pa- Paul and Silas, at the word of the Lord, go to Macedonia. They see a move of God through Lydia. They cast out a demon in this slave girl. The riot goes crazy. They're thrown into prison, not just any prison, but the deepest part of the prison, and they're shackled there, and it's midnight. And they're not just raging at the injustice of the thing. Come on, they weren't given a trial. This was not supposed to happen. This isn't just demonic warfare. This is like systems breaking, breaking, breaking down. And they're in the prison. And at midnight, what are they doing? They're drinking from a well that hasn't run dry. They're breaking up the river. They're breaking open the river in the dry places. Come on, they're living like a well-watered garden in a sun-scorched land. They're singing and they're praising God. And the freedom that's on the inside of them gets so intense, it breaks out of them to cause an earthquake. It's not something like, is it coming down or is it coming from within? Well, Jesus says it comes from within. I love what my friend Josh Hollingsworth said. He says there was an earthquake because the freedom on them was inside of them. They were so free from their circumstance, so above it in the spirit, that that kind of freedom on the inside being expressed through song and praise literally caused an earthquake. It says the doors immediately flew open. All the shackles broke off because they knew how to drink from a source that doesn't run dry. Or what about John in Revelation? Exiled. 
in the spirit on the Lord's day, not the Sabbath, the Lord's day, which was what they called, it was the day they celebrated the resurrection. He was in the spirit. He was exiled for preaching the gospel. He was at the right place at the right time with the right people and he was exiled to Patmos. Paul was at the right place at the right time with the right people and he was in prison. And they weren't raging at the injustice. They were drinking from a well in the spirit on the Lord's day and he sees Jesus. Well, we've got to learn how to tap into that spirit place. So then when we come to places like this and we're gathered together, what are we doing? We're trying to encourage each other. Just gaze at God and drink. In your quiet time, when you are on your own in your room and the circumstances are unjust and you feel the pressure of the circumstances, what do you do? Do you know how to drink in that circumstance? Do you know how? Do you know how to create that river in the desert place? I was in bed the other, this was a few weeks ago, and my mind was just like kind of racing, and I was thinking about, we know we're still believing God for a building solution to fall into place. So continue to pray with us. Thank you guys for coming today at 2.30 to pray fast on Wednesdays. And why are we praying for a building? Because we believe it's connected to the bigger thing that God's doing of bringing people to be saved. The church prayed for Peter to be released. They specifically prayed for Peter to be released. And they weren't ashamed of that because they needed Peter out of prison for the sake of the gospel among the nations. And we're asking God for buildings because I'd rather not take nine months to find a place to baptize people. <laughs> Praise God. So we're asking God in faith for these things. And I was in bed and I was trying to go to sleep and my mind was racing and all of this. And, and I just got hit with this revelation. Stacey, Paul and Silas were singing and praying at midnight. And you know how it's so easy to like just completely disconnect the Bible stories from your life? When you read the Bible, you're like, oh yeah, if I was Paul and Silas, I'd be praying it up and prophesying and seeing people. And then you're in the circumstance and you're literally paralyzed with anxiety in bed, can't go to sleep. And it hits me, it's like, oh, oh, now's the time to get up at midnight and pray and sing. Now's the time. And Jesus rocking up with this lady right there at the well, telling her about all this dysfunction, saying, that won't satisfy you. Now's the time to worship in spirit and in truth. Stop drinking from that well, that broken cistern called husbands, <laughs> and let's drink from the well that will satisfy. So worship gets very up in your face and not reserved on this high shelf for glory moments. It comes right into racial conflict, broken relationships, the injustice of systems gone wrong and riots compelled by demons, and it happens right there, right in your work stress, right in your injustice, right, right in the midst of unanswered prayer. That's when singing and praying and praising can open up things. Well, this is what it means to be a river in the desert to live a life like a well-watered garden in a sun-scorched place is to learn to drink. Learn to drink from the well, the source that's satisfied. When you're weary and you're burnt out and your kids are driving you crazy, that's the time. That's the time. When people are driving you mad and you hate your job and you hate your school and you hate your life, now's the time. <laughs> That's the perfect time to come up. I was in the spirit on the Lord's day. That's the time to rise up above the circumstances when you were made for this, for spirit and in truth. You were made to be a river in the desert. You were made to be a well-watered garden. You were made to break it open in your own heart and home with manifestations of the presence of God.